Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said, saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you this morning for uh, deliverance from hell. Father, we are at least able to thank you, Father, uh, for an escape from hell. For those who have not possibly received deliverance from hell, Father, may they take the escape route this morning. Uh, Father, I pray that you would uh, uh, make hell real to all of us here. I know that most people in this room are saved and born again. I know that most folks in this room are not going to hell. But, Father, hell still needs to be real to us. We just pray this morning that you would uh, make it real. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, the subject, of course, this morning is the least fashionable of all the doctrines that anybody could preach or teach. You know, when uh, when somebody uh, decides that uh, they need to be more uh, careful with the environment and they start talking about the environment and how now... You know, they're going to be careful to use environmentally friendly products and not use free on, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, people say, well, you know, that's probably good because that's a good cause. When somebody decides to leave home and leave the family and go off into politics because they have this burning desire to serve and in government and for, for service to the people, people say, well, you know, that's probably good because that's a good cause. When an old lady... Uh, can't think of anything else but her next six lotto tickets and goes in front of, uh, goes in the, the, the convenience store and stands in front of people while she gets paid off for a lottery ticket so you can't even buy a Coke, got to stand behind old ladies looking for lottery tickets. You know, people, uh, people say, well, you know, that's okay. When somebody uh, uh, gets concerned about money and uh, career and all those things, when somebody can quote the batting averages of the last 40,000 people that have ever played baseball, when they start worrying about how the house looks and how the yard looks and all that becomes the main cause, that's okay. When somebody comes out of the closet, well, you know, that's, that's probably good, whatever makes you happy. But you know, when somebody becomes chiefly concerned about whether somebody is going to hell or not, they're a kook. You ever notice that if the little weenie dog gets up at 2 in the morning and barks and wakes the family to keep him from burning up because the fire started in the house, he gets written up in the paper. Paul Revere gets on a horse and warns the colonists and becomes a historical figure. Somebody jumps in a, a torrential uh, river with a flood and saves somebody and drinks. He makes the 6 o'clock news. Guy gets down the street corner and warns somebody about going to hell and his mother's ashamed. And his wife gets nasty phone calls and his kids are are uh, ostracized at school. Um, see, folks, other doctrines can be made palatable. Other doctrines can be made to meet men's standards of positivity, um, uh, acceptability, uh, open-mindedness, tolerance, and that kind of thing. I mean, folks, uh, everybody here knows probably some of the some of the rowdiest bums, some of the coarsest gamblers, some of the vilest sinners will many times sit in a church at a funeral or at a funeral home at a funeral and listen to respectfully and patiently to discourses about the love of God and the pearly gate and all this, that, and the other. But brethren, that you cannot garnish hell. 
Uh, you can make the love of God such that everybody's loved of God and that kind of thing, but when the subject comes up about hell, you, you can't arrange flowers around it, you can't light a potpourri candle. <laughs> you know, you, there, there's just no way to garnish the doctrine of hell. The impact cannot possibly be lessened. And the brutal fact of the matter is, is that if we're going to accept the teachings and doctrines of, uh, that Christ taught about the love of God, then you're going to have to accept what he taught about damnation too. If you are going to embrace his promises of salvation, you cannot reject what he said about damnation. If you are going to hope in the comforts of glory and of heaven, then you cannot help but acknowledge the torments of hell because you can't reject things just because you don't like them. That's the way things are. Don't be a hypocrite. Either accept all of it or reject all of it. But don't throw out hell and then accept the love of God. Now, to be perfectly frank with you, hell has probably turned more people away from the Bible and Christianity than anything else. I don't mean that bad. I mean, praise the Lord for the Bible. That, that's to the discredit of men, it's to the credit of God and to the credit of the Bible. The truth of the matter is, is if it weren't for hell, uh, there would probably be more people claiming to be Christians. Hell has turned many a philosopher like Aristotle and Socrates away because they're afraid of hell, they're concerned about hell and those sort of things. And again, that, that's to, to man's discredit, that's to the Bible's credit. Uh, somebody said one time that he that air-conditioned hell is uh, probably uh, planning to move in. And that's always the case. It is. But the, but the fact remains that salvation without a hell is not a very profound thing. If all Christianity has to offer is to make me happier in this life, that's not a very profound thing. There are a lot of things that offer that. I got saved so I wouldn't go to hell. I don't know about you. I got saved for a lot of reasons. I was miserable. I was broken, I was tired, I was a sinner, I was guilty, but I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. Okay? Now, nevertheless, there have been whole, there are whole generations of people alive today that are deceived about hell. They have been assured and reassured over and over again that uh, the God that we have would not possibly conceive a place like hell. Uh, they have been comforted and calmed by the fact that the idea of hell must have come from some uh, culture that was cruel and outrageous and, 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 and primitive. They are, have been told over and over again that there is no scientific evidence for hell. They are just happy to know that most people don't really think that there's a hell. I'm telling you, though, that every day in the obituary columns there's a page full of people that pass across the veil of life and death and they were surprised. The obituaries this morning were filled with them. Every moment I'm telling you that somebody else wakes up to a bewildered, astounded stupefaction of where they are. People go to hell. I uh, want to preach this morning for a little while about the surprises of hell. Okay, there's no way to make it pretty. If you want it positive, you're going to have to leave. Because it can't be positive. You can't. There's nothing positive about hell. All right? There just can't be. There, but there are some... I'm assured that there are going to be all kinds of people and have been all kinds of people that have gone to hell or will go to hell and they're going to be surprised by what they find. I want to say, first of all, they're going to be surprised by the reality of it. This rich man died. He died rich, respectable, and all the things, as far as we know, that a man's supposed to die as. There is no testimony here of some uh, 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 tormented, thrashing death, horrifying death. There's no indication that he had any premonitions of, of what was going on. There's no indication that he did anything but die quietly in his sleep, and yet he woke up in a lake of fire. He woke up in a pit. He woke up in hell. I wonder, I got thinking, and I got wondering what it must be like to try to adjust. Ever think about that? 
I mean, you get on an airplane and fly to Eastern Europe, it takes a day or so to adjust. Okay? Uh, pull an all-nighter, you know, uh, uh, pull two shifts in a row, you know, like some of the guys do. It takes a little while to adjust. Thought about it often, what it's going to be like to, to, to die and, and uh, instantaneously to be absent from the bodies be present with the Lord, somebody saved. Just get up there and you've left a, a stinking, filthy, sick bed, maybe with cancer or some such thing, not able to control your bodily fluids or anything else. And then you, you wake up on the other side with a perfect body in a perfect place and all this light and all this sin and all this glory and all this. It's got to take a little while to adjust. Whoa, I'm here. Well, folks, what must it be like to wake up in hell and to instantaneously have none of your expectations realized? All the lies and all the hopes that you told yourself or had been told, all the things that you had grown to hope just might be true were dashed in a single moment. What must it be to wake up and to have your very worst fears exceeded utterly? Utterly exceeded. The Bible says that I have not seen, neither hath ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what things the God, the things that God has prepared for them that love it. That's heaven. And to some degree, there's, there are things that haven't passed through your mind that you're going to experience. There's no way that you can grasp fear what God has for you in heaven. Well, if that's true, it's got to be just the same, only opposite with hell. I mean, what must it be like to wake up there to imagine going? You can imagine first the torment. But after you've imagined the torment and haven't fully realized it, imagine what it must be like, the, the mental frame that you're in, because you're not only in torment and agony from the very start, but the facts start settling in that there's never, ever going to be uh, any, kind of, any kind of reprieve, no other opportunity, uh, no hope, no escape, no companionship, no alternative. No time. Just a, a clock on the wall with no hands on it. It's just moment by moment, hour by hour, day after day of torment and agony. And you say, you really think God's going to do that? I, I know that God does that. If anything is true in this Bible, if the Bible's not true, I'm convinced that nothing's true. If the Bible's true, God has done that for thousands of years. And he'll do it for many thousands of more. I can't help but wonder about the reality of it. I wonder if, if in the midst of it, if people, if, if stupid lines that people have heard pass their mind. In my generation, Coke for a while was the real thing. I wonder if somebody down there that ever saw that commercial is thinking, it's the real thing, it's the real thing. Well, maybe they saw the bumper sticker that said, get real. What if those things pass their mind? People have used the uh, oh hell and oh god are now two of the commonest um, uh, exclamations you can say. I mean, uh, you know, they're somewhere they've been reduced somewhere below below oh damn. Damn's still kind of a bad word, but you know, oh hell and oh god, you know, that's that's nothing. That's nothing whatsoever. I wonder if somebody in hell has going through his mind all the time that he said derisively, oh hell. Who the hell do you think you are? Where the hell have you been? What the hell are you doing here? I just wonder. I can't help but wonder if those sort of things go through somebody's mind. Maybe you'll wander around down there in the pit. Maybe you'll run up on a guy and ask him his name. His name is Pontius Pilate. Say, hey, man, how long have you been here? I've been here for 2,000 years. And, and then it starts to dawn. It really starts to sink in. If this guy's been here for 2,000 years. How much longer are we going to be here? I've been here for 15 minutes. He's been here for 2,000 years. Maybe you'll run across a guy named Cora or Dathan or a Byron. And man, how long have you been here? Oh, about 3,500 years now. Run across a guy named Cain. How long have you been here? Oh, uh, lost track. Upwards of 5,000 years. And maybe it'll finally start to sink in that this is all the reality you ever know. Don't go there. Don't go there. I'd like you to note something else that somebody's going to be surprised about. I'd like you to note that they're not only going to be surprised about the reality of it. I believe that one of the greatest surprises will be who is there. In the first place, the rich man had to be shocked that he was there. 
And that's the first shock. The first shock is that, well, I'm here. But it doesn't just stop there. I believe that folks are going to be aghast at who else they find there. Yeah, yeah, that Hitler's going to be there. We're pretty sure of that. You know, Marx and Lenin and Stalin and uh, Mussolini, those they have the devil will eventually wind up. They expect that. Probably run up on Buddha somewhere, run up on Muhammad somewhere. Charlie Manson's going to wind up going if he doesn't get it right. You run up on Jack the Ripper, you run up on Son of Sam probably. Uh, run up on a few rock bands and John Belushi and John Lennon, some of those guys. You can't expect that, but there's going to be some other surprises. Hell's going to be chock full of Baptist preachers. You understand? Hell's going to be chock full of popes. You're going to find people in hell that were Red Cross volunteers. You're going to find people in hell that were founders of charitable institutions. You're going to find in hell doctors. You're going to find in hell hard-working, simple farmers. You're going to find in hell many a jolly grandfather. You're going to find in hell the, the jolly old lady that used to bake you cookies when you were a kid. You're going to find in hell uh, a lot of folks that never committed adultery and never committed fornication and never extorted anything. But even worse, many a man, many a woman is going to find his mother there. Maybe the guy knew he was going to hell all along. But one of his last nine thoughts was, what a good mother. His mother had been how he failed his mother. How his mother had always gone to church. How his mother had always, you know, uh, uh, been a good mother and tried to discipline him, tried to raise him right, teaching that drinking was wrong and teaching that this was wrong and that was wrong. He winds up in hell and there's mama. So that's going to be a shock. Wind up in hell and find... That godly minister there that never spoke a foul word, nobody ever could testify of seeing him smoke or drink or any such thing, turns out that he's there. Now, that grates against some of your grains right now. You know why? Because of all the things that are going to be a surprise in hell, I believe that one of the greatest things is going to be the admixture of sinners. The folks are going to walk into a room and they're going to see some supposedly godly grandmother in the same room with Hitler, in the same damnable place as Mussolini or Stalin or, or murderers or rapists and such, and then it maybe will begin to dawn that the issue has never been how bad your sins were. Amen. That has never been the issue. The issue is not what kind of sinner you were. The issue is not how extreme the sin was. The issue has ever and always been only that you're a sinner. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you all go to the same place. Look at, let's run a few references. I did a little study and never actually done it this way. Look at Psalm 9, Psalm chapter 9. People are going to be surprised by who is there. Psalm 9, verse 17. We all know this verse. The wicked shall be turned into hell. In all the nations that forget God. What's the sin? Just forgetting. So well, that's not so bad. Bad enough to go to hell. Forget your Bible stories as a little kid. Pretty soon you're distant and far from church. And pretty soon you're far from God and God no longer talks to you. And you're no longer convicted because your conscience is seared. So you die and you go to hell. Because you forgot. You just forgot. Nothing more. Oh, honey, I forgot the milk. I know you sent me for milk and eggs, I forgot the milk. I forgot. Don't go to hell. All the nations that forget God. Notice Matthew chapter 7. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hell is going to be chock full of people that have all the right words. Lord, Lord. Ever talked to somebody and they didn't know they were saved? And then you said, they asked you, well, how do you get saved? And you said, well, you know, you have to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for your sins and shed his blood for you. If you believe on Christ uh, like that, then you oh, yeah, that's what I've done. They said the right words. You know in your heart they didn't mean those words. They didn't take to themselves 
the, the suffering, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They didn't put their faith and trust there. They just said they did. Lord, Lord. People said the right words. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Verse 11, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out the outer darkness. Darkness. The outter darkness is hell. There's going to be a whole ton of people in hell that were never intended to go there. Children of the kingdom. The Bible says that hell was was uh, made for the devil and his angels. Anybody that goes to hell doesn't belong there. It was made for something else. Made for somebody else. I'd like you to note something that will be in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, under heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have re remained unto this day. Hell's going to be chock full of people that saw all kinds of things. They say, well, I'm not going to believe because I just can't see it. I've never seen it. It's because you saw it didn't mean a thing. Hell's going to be full of people that saw all kinds of things. Imagine what it'd be to go to hell after having walked 2,000 years ago in the same land, in the same town, on the same street with Jesus Christ. Look upon his bruised and battered body, wondering what was going on there. Imagine what it'd be to then go to hell. All kinds of people are going to go to hell have seen all kinds of things. I'd like you to note in Matthew 23. Matthew 23. 15. 23.15. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Ye compass land and uh, sea and land to make one proselyte. When he is made, you make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. Hell's going to be chock full of religious people. Making proselytes. Going door to door. Knocking doors. Trying to get people into the kingdom. And once they get them, they don't make them a child of God will make them a child of the devil and right. twice worse than they are. Right. Hell is going to be full of religious people. Hell is going to be full of people that were almost persuaded. Agrippa, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Hell is going to be full of people that, that, that were waiting for a more convenient season. At a convenient season, says Herod, I'll send unto thee. Hell is going to be full of people who did many things. Herod, in the days of John the Baptist, the Bible says that he called for John the Baptist and sent for him and did many things. He turned over a new leaf. He corrected all kinds of things. He quit his smoking. And maybe he quit his cussing. So that his wife, his wife goes, Oh, it's not too bad. Looks like my husband's got religion finally. Time go to hell. It's going to be full of people who admitted to having sin. Pharaoh. I sinned this time. Judas. I sinned against innocent blood. Dying to hell. Hell's going to be full of people who believe in God. Yeah. The devils believe in trouble. Say, so, well, how do I stay out of hell? Believe the right thing. Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ's blood is able to cleanse that sin. Know full well that your sins deserve hell, that you deserve to go there, and that Jesus Christ died and laid down on a cross in your place willingly as a volunteer, and they drove the nails through, and they crucified him, and he bled and suffocated to death in your place, and then rose again the third day, and that blood is still cleansed. Otherwise, brethren, you're going to die and go to hell. I'd like you to know that one of the surprises in hell is the reality of it. The other surprise is who is there. Another surprise, who's not there? People are going to wander, I'm sure, after they get used to it for a little while, if there's such a thing as getting used to it, and wander around, you know, uh, looking for some of the people that they're sure have to be here. But don't look for that great adulterer, or that great murderer, David, because he ain't there. Don't look for that suicidal maniac, Samson. Because he ain't there. Don't look there for Moses the murderer. Moses the hothead. Because he's not there. As a matter of fact, don't even look for that wicked king, Manasseh. If I read things right here, so the Bible says in Second Chronicles chapter 33 that Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err 
to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel, and so on? Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host, the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, and heard his supplication. Don't look for Manasseh. He's not there. Don't look for uh, the dying thief. He ain't there. He was never baptized. Don't look for that murderous inquisitor, Paul, Saul of Tarsus. He's not going to be there. There are several million heretics that were burned from about 300 A.D. to about 1700 A.D. in Europe and France and Germany. They were all killed for, for the uh, sin of heresy against the so-called truth, against the so-called church. There's many a pope that winds up in hell that goes and looks for some of those heretics. And they ain't there. I <laughs> bumper sticker the other day. It was on the back of one of these nut cars, nutso cars. You know, somebody, you know, with the... Uh, there, there was the, I don't know how, you know, she had about 78 stickers on the back end of her car, just a little station wagon, but, you know, there was the, there was the, the pro-woman corner down here, you know, with all the, the, the woman stuff, and then there was the environmental stuff up here. You know, this woman was somebody who'd throw ketchup on your, your fur coat, you know what I'm saying? And uh, on that thing, one of the bumper stickers that caught my eye was, the road to hell is paved with Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody might be surprised which Republicans are not in hell. Of course, some people might be surprised with some Republicans that are, but, you know. But the liar and the cheat and the thief and the gossip that you hate so bad, you go down there and you go in and you hope that one of the comforts you get is to see this person suffer that did you all this wrong. I'm not justifying their sin if they did you wrong. Just because they did that sin doesn't mean they're going to hell. What would you think if Ted Bundy was in hell? What would you think if Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't really in hell? I don't know if they are or not. Each of them had a testimony that they got saved before they were put in an electric chair. Oh, preacher! I don't believe in deathbed uh, confessions. I don't believe in deathbed conversions. I think deathbed conversions are a really bad idea. If you're waiting for your deathbed to be converted, you, you, you're playing a game that's... You're playing a fool's game. But I believe in deathbed conversion. Because it gets down to the fact that you think that somebody can't be forgiven for a sin that you never did. Now, I'll tell you again, the issue again is not how bad the sin was. The issue is where your sin is. The issue is Who's bearing your sins in hell? You going to bear your own sin, or you going to let somebody else bear it? Jesus Christ will bear it. Who's not there? That's going to be a great surprise. I'm not going to be there. Uh, some people would like to see you there. I'm sure. I ain't going. If you if you want to be away from me in eternity, go to hell. Because I am not going. I'm not going to be there. So, oh, you just think you're righteous. No, no, I'm not. That's the point. I'd like you to know something else. Look at verse 24 of, of Luke. Luke 16, Luke 16, 24. Back to our text here. They're going to be surprised by the reality of it. Surprised who is there. Surprised who's not there. Notice here verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. All the time, if you deal with sinners for very long, you'll run across a rowdy once in a while, some teenager, some, uh, some redneck that has half a keg of beer already stuffed away in his big gut. And you're going to hear people say stuff, well, yeah, I'm going to go to hell and party in hell. 
All my friends are in hell. All the hell raisers are finally going to be together, and we're going to raise hell, and we're going to blow the doors off of hell. <laughs> and they really think, you know, they're, they really think they're getting somewhere there. It may be surprising to learn that there's no partying in hell. As a matter of fact, all the friends that go there are only concerned with weeping, wailing, and gnashing their teeth. But it may be surprising to folks what is actually on people's minds that are in hell. Verse 24 is one of the most pitiful, shattering pictures in all the Bible. Do you know why? Because in that verse you have people that are consumed with nothing else than just the tiniest microscopic relief. You have people in that verse that are obsessed with just the slightest bit of remembrance. Verse 24 is one of the most pitiful, shattering pictures in all the Bible. you know why? Because in that verse you have people that are consumed with nothing else than just the tiniest microscopic relief. You have people in that verse that are obsessed with just the slightest bit of remittance. If you had been in my study at 10.30 last night, you would have seen me with a glass of water sticking my finger in it to see how many drops I could get off. For the second knuckle, I get five drops. <laughs> For the first knuckle, I get three drops. Anybody with a lick of sense knows that three to five drops of water in a lake of fire isn't going to amount to a hill of beans. As a matter of fact, three to five drops of water on a cool autumn Minnesota day doesn't amount to anything at all. Five drops of water doesn't amount to anything. You see what's the point? We pray, and rightly so, for, you know, pray the Lord blesses a, a table loaded down with food. Pray the Lord, you know, helps us get over a cold. Pray the Lord blesses a service. Pray the Lord blesses a special. Pray the Lord gets us the right job for the right money for this, that, and rightfully so. People in hell pray that they might be blessed with an insignificant amount of relief. One of the surprises in hell will be the pitiful obsession with any relief, whatever. There's no way to make this positive. I can't make it positive for you positive thinkers. I can't make it bleed self-esteem. People in hell will be reduced to crawling around begging for three drops of water which isn't going to amount to anything whatever. Now then, next time you're all torqued off at somebody, one of your Christian brothers or sisters in Jesus Christ, you remember where you were going. You get all torqued out of shape and, you know, huff around like uh, some puffed up frog for about six weeks because somebody looked at you cross legs. They really did you wrong. And you remember what you were going to be reduced to before you became a child of God. You were going to be reduced to begging for anything whatever besides just what you want. Look at verse uh, 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise lad of evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. One of the next things that folks are going to be surprised about in hell is the un utter inflexibility of the law there. See, in verse 24, no. Verse 29, no. Verse 31, absolutely not. Now, I don't know what you think. You know, this is, uh, it says Father Abraham here. Uh, Abraham is at this point in Abraham's bosom. Some of you know all that doctrine. I'm going to get into all that. Um, Abraham's plainly plant, uh, standing in the place of God here, at least. 
And, you know, when I stop and think about uh, Abraham in the Bible, you know, uh, Abraham has to be one of the most approachable people in all the Bible. I mean, you know, if, uh, if you're going to approach Moses, you know, he might might whack you with a stick or something, you know. But, but you know, Abraham was the patriarch of, of, all, of all Jews. You know, he's a, he was plainly kind. He, he wasn't hot-tempered. And even when uh, Hagar had to be set out in the wilderness, you know, you could tell that, that he felt great sorrow and was greatly grieved about it. In, in general, just somebody that's very approachable that you would expect of, of all people in hell to be able to get some, some compassion from, you go and ask for something that was not asking much. Three drops of water. Five drops of water. No. Well, send Lazarus and, 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 and tell my family. No. Come on, Father Abraham, give me a break. If you'll send him, they'll, they'll believe. No. I'm talking about utter inflexibility. In America especially, we are more or less, we more or less expect that we continue to have liberties and freedoms and personhood and all that kind of stuff, all that humanistic stuff. We, we expect our, our suggestions to be accepted. We expect our opinions to be honored, at least with gentility. But in hell, there's no liberty. There is no privilege. There is no suggestion. What you're reduced to is living an introverted life of your pain, your agony. It's funny because it's not funny. It's interesting that people in this life want to live for themselves. Given less to themselves, most people would be totally and complete. If they didn't need somebody else from outside, they would be wholly consumed with themselves. Well, brethren, in hell, you finally get there. Because the only people that matter in the universe at that point is you. It's your pain in your little cubicle of being forever and ever and ever. So I just don't believe in a God that that's cruel. God's not cruel at all. The issue is not the cruelty of God. The issue is that you have the wrong nature to be with God. And unless you're born again, you bear your sins and God will not put up with them. It's not an issue of God being cruel. It's an issue of you getting rid of your sins so you can be like God. I'd like you to note something else. Verse uh, 28 verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. You'd be surprised by the magnitude of missionary fervor in hell. Uh, everybody today hates hellfire preachers. Everybody today hates the Bible thumper. Most of you know that by now. Your first reaction was to go tell Mama. Maybe it was 20 years ago, maybe it was six weeks ago. Your first reaction was to go, when you got saved, to go tell somebody that you knew and loved the truth. And you expected them to embrace it the way you did. And you learned real quick that what they were interested in was making sure that you didn't wind up a Bible thumper. A hellraiser. But everybody knows that everybody hates a Bible thumper and a hellraiser. It's kind of funny because in hell everybody wants to be a Bible thumper. In, in hell. In hell everybody is a hellfire preacher. In hell everybody wants to get the word out. I, I wish that... Uh, I wish that you could hear Socrates and Plato's message today. It'd be a lot different from the one that they wrote about back down there. 
I wish this morning that you could hear now Albert Einstein's theories. From Albert Einstein now. I wish you could. Because I assure you that this morning they are different than they were in 1940. I wish this morning, and I'm, I'm assuming she's dead, uh, she kind of disappeared, but I wish you could hear what Madeline Murray O'Hare's theme is now. I wish, I wish that you could hear today what Hitler thinks. It didn't have anything to do with no Third Reich. It didn't have anything to do with superior race. It didn't have anything to do with Poland or Eastern Europe. I wish you could hear today what Julius Caesar and Nero and Napoleon and Liberace and Princess Di. Brethren, Mother Teresa has a wholly different message today than she had six months ago. Okay? John Lennon, well, I wish he could sing to you today. Because he wouldn't be singing some of that trash music. <clears throat> Next time you get a little bit aggravated by one of our overzealous brethren, they're always talking about hell and always trying to get the word in. And, you know, maybe they, uh, you know, maybe they don't uh, uh, follow completely your lines of polity and courtesy. I want to tell you right now, if it were possible for Hitler or Einstein or some of those guys to come back from the dead, I'll tell you this, they wouldn't be concerned about being nice. Brother, they would have a message that would sear your ears. And I don't think that they would care one iota whether they offended you or not. Not a bit. There is no way to scream fire politely. You cannot make this message positive. You cannot, at 2.30 in the morning, with a fire raging in the basement, be concerned about being polite. People in hell will be surprised by the magnitude of the missionary fervor there. They'll be surprised by the uh, uh, regard for righteousness there. Verse 30. Nay, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Hell is going to be full of holy rollers. Hell is going to be full of people that are really interested in righteousness. Repentance. Get to stand right. And they themselves will never get a chance that they would give anything at all to tell you not to go there. Be surprised by the missionary zeal. One last thing. Verse 29, Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Verse 31, he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. One of the great surprises in hell will be the unequal esteem for the Word of God. Verse 31, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. That was in reaction to verse 14, 15, and 16, where the Pharisees were laughing and mocking. And he finally says in verse 16, The law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man pressed into it. His response there was to the Pharisees. In verse 31, he says, if one rose from the dead, and yet they wouldn't believe Moses and the prophets, they still wouldn't believe. Brethren, one did rise from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. And the main body of the Pharisees still didn't believe. The main body of the Sadducees still didn't believe. I'd like you to note that one of the surprises in hell will be the unequal esteem from the Lord, for the Word of God. I was thinking, you know, with all the stuff going on with the Clinton White House and all, and all the so-called leaks and all, it's interesting that there are no leaks from hell. The Lord has that thing sealed up. The only word that ever got out from hell is this one right here. This chapter right here. Is whatever, whatever snapshot the God, that God gives you of hell, that's the only snapshot you get. There are no leaks. You know why? 
because he says, and these, this, these are the words now of, of Abraham, the patriarch, that kindly old man, that kindly old vagabond Jew that was the friend of God. His reaction to the word of God was, you can believe what's written, or you can go to hell, because you're not getting anything else. Hey, brother, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hell is full of Bible believers. I really mean that. But I'm just saying it because I'm one, and I'm just sure that hell has to line up. I'm telling you folks that hell is full of Bible believers. You don't get any higher illumination than the Bible. There are surprises in hell. The reality of it, who's there, who's not there. The pitiful obsession with relief. The utter inflexibility of the law. The magnitude of the missionary fervor. The unequal esteem for the Word of God. I hope nobody in here is going to hell. I hope if you are going to hell this morning, if you've never been born again, I, first of all, I hope you know you're going there. If you've never been born again. And if you have never been born again, I hope that you will take the escape route. You are a fool to a tossed back the life ring. You are a fool to push the ladder away from a burning building. Okay? You, you, are, you are a fool to cut your parachute ropes. And it's done every day. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved. Let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, Father, uh, earnestly pray this morning, Lord, that you give God's people, your people, a uh, earnest and insightful picture in the place called hell. Lord, let us not lightly uh, skip over these words that we've read. Father, may we... Uh, get the full import and impact of every word the Holy Spirit put there and all the meanings, Father, that we might uh, not take hell as a flippant thing. Father, I pray for somebody here that's never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior. Father, may they see that the escape route is only through Christ, only through His blood. But by grace you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, that any man should boast. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.